The power to strip foreign-born Britons of their citizenship. The UK passes a controversial amendment to its immigration bill. Critics argue the measure could leave people stateless and stuck. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. In Doha, I'm Adrian Finnegan. A contentious bill in the UK is one step away from becoming law. Now, if adopted, it will allow the government there to strip foreign-born people of their British citizenship when they're accused of terrorism. The immigration bill expands existing powers to revoke passports for naturalised citizens whose conduct is deemed to be seriously prejudicial to the UK's interests. Opponents say that two safeguards added to the bill still won't prevent suspects from being made permanently stateless. Legal experts also question whether it could be a breach of international law. Well, we've been trying for someone from the government to speak to us. That hasn't been possible, but speaking in the House of Lords, Lord Taylor of Holbeach, the Parliamentary Under-Secretary of State for the Home Office, stressed that the new powers would be used with caution. The Home Secretary would reach a decision only after very careful consideration of the facts of an individual case. She will reach a decision based on whether she reasonably believes the person has recourse to another nationality under the law of another country. Well, let's bring in our guests for today, all of whom join us from London. Claire Algar is Executive Director of Reprieve. Also joining us, Robin Simcox, a research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society, and Sakia Hussein, a lawyer who represents a Somali-born man whose British citizenship was revoked in 2012. Thank you all for being with us on today's Inside Story. Claire, Claire Algar, we'll start with you. Uh, surely the British government is perfectly entitled to take away someone's citizenship if it feels that their presence is, is not conducive to the public good. Uh, no, I, I don't think that that's the case at all. Um, and I think, I think part of the issue around this is the fact that citizenship stripping, um, as well as being rather difficult to say, also sounds quite inoffensive. Um, and I've been racking my brains for a better, a better term, and the best one I can come up with is, is the sort of medieval form of banishment. Um, but the US Supreme Court came up with a considerably better version, possibly unsurprising, which I might just read out, because I think it gives a better version of what's actually going on here. Um, and they say that there may be no physical mistreatment. There is instead the total destruction of the individual's status in organized society. It is a form of punishment more primitive than torture, for it destroys the individual, sorry, it destroys for the individual the political existence that was centuries in the development. And this is the important bit. Uh, the individual's very existence is at the sufferance of the country in which he happens to find himself. While any one country may accord him some rights, no country need do so because he is stateless. And that's the point. You're, you're removing from somebody the right to have rights. Um, and that is an extremely significant thing, more so than, for example, sending them to prison. And the thing that I think is astonishing about this move is that it can be done with literally no due process. Uh, it, is, it is at the discretion of the Home Secretary, which means you have to trust the Home Secretary implicitly not to make a mistake. And what I don't understand is why this can't go in front of a judge, wh why something this serious should not get its tyres kicked by a judge, um, oh. because that would seem to me to be the natural way of doing things. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. Uh, Robin Simcox, what, what do you make of this amendment to the immigration bill? What are, uh, as far as you're concerned, the, the implications of it? And how does it differ... Uh, to legislation that the government's already used to strip people of their citizenship. The law itself is nothing new. It was, it was first introduced in, what, 2003? Well, I think that the, the way the Home Secretary puts it is that British citizenship for uh, foreign people coming, coming to the UK is a, is a privilege, it's not a right. And there's going to be a very small amount of cases, and I'm sure it will be very small, um, of terror suspects here who flout that. Uh, we've had it historically in the UK for a couple of decades now, uh, where people have come to the UK and, and, and uh, inspired acts of terrorism um, with almost impunity and, and not been able to be removed to their country of origin. What the Home Secretary is doing is not some kind of uh, attempt to 
crack down with no justification. It's looking at the overall threat of the seriousness of the terror threat within the UK and doing all she can to try and control it. Uh, this is one part of, of a broader attempt, but I think it's a part that could be important, bearing in mind some of the problems we've had in the past with foreign-born terror suspects. So here, Hussein, where does this leave the law and the British justice system. Now, surely, if someone does something that is, against, that is against British law, it is, as Claire was saying, up to the courts and a jury to decide whether to strip someone of their citizenship and not the government, who, as I understand it, can do so only after uh, consulting a judge who will take a decision on, on the balance of probabilities. What, what are the dangers here? Well, I think Claire covered the, the dangers uh, involved here, the fact that it leaves somebody stateless. But I, what I want to add is a couple of more things. It's the actual, uh, what's actually happened to three of my clients who were made stateless. One of them, Amedi Hashi, was actually, um, shortly after being made stateless, was kidnapped and held in a black detention site and then renditioned to the United States um, shortly after he, he was made stateless. Two others, shortly after being made stateless, were actually killed by a drone. So there's a danger, there's a danger that a lot of people haven't looked into, which is that in the past, where the Britain had to apologise for allowing British citizens to be held incommunicado in black sites abroad, and uh, they were tortured and a compensation was paid. Now, by using this power, the government can wash its hands off, can collude before uh, removing this, uh, the citizenship with another foreign power, mainly the Americans, and say, well, wait until we remove the, uh, their citizenship. Afterwards, you can do what you like. And in the case of Mehdi Hashi and a couple of others where people have been renditioned and killed in a drone, that is the pattern. Robin, uh, uh, there's a point there, isn't there? What responsibilities does the British government have towards an individual whose life may be in danger if they return to their country of origin? But I don't think the point here, the point, the reason people are getting killed in drone strikes isn't because they've become stateless, it's become, because they're part of a, uh, a terrorist organisation that the United States is at war with. And it's the same with, with the cases here of, of Rendition. This is somebody, Madi Hashi, who's going to be put in front of a United States jury. He's facing very serious terrorism charges, and due process will have its day. I think that once you, 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 you forfeit certain rights if you join up with a terrorist organization um, that has been responsible for countless deaths throughout the world, I mean, we, you can't downplay the seriousness of the actions of some of these individuals. Claire, I know you want to come back on that. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, of course it's the case that if individuals have been involved with plotting terror attacks or whatever, those individuals should be arrested, they should be prosecuted, they should be found guilty and they should be sent to prison. The, the, I think what has happened uh, and what is relevant to this, this discussion is that some of the people who uh, the Americans had in their sights when they went away were at that point deliberately stripped of their citizenship by the British government so that they would not then have to offer consular assistance and indeed so that um, when drone strikes took place that, that could take place without um, you know, there having to be inquests concluded and so forth. And you know, I, I think that I absolutely believe that people who um, are guilty of plotting terrorist offences should be uh, prosecuted with, with the full force of the law. But I think that somehow sentencing them to death by removing their passports is not the way in which we should be operating. Robin Sincox, in the case of people who've been stripped of citizenship because they've, for instance, uh, fought in Syria, isn't there a, a certain hypocrisy uh, at play here. The British government has supported Syrian rebels in, in their fight against uh, President Bashar al-Assad and yet seeks to revoke the citizenship of, of British Syrians when they, they return after fighting alongside the rebels. Well, no. What the, the government will do is, is seek, potentially seek to revoke the citizenship of those that have joined up with al-Qaeda-affiliated groups such as the al-Nusra Front, such as the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham. If people are genuinely going for humanitarian uh, reasons and there's no proof that they've aligned themselves with terrorist groups, then this won't be a problem. And there isn't really hypocrisy in this because the British government has been very clear about saying it doesn't want to send any aid at all uh, to al-Qaeda affiliated groups. It's gone to great pains 
to avoid doing so, and arguably that's one of the reasons it hasn't got involved in the Syrian conflict further. So it is doing all it can on that front, and I, I just don't really recognise those, those charges of hypocrisy against it. There's many things the British government does wrong, but in this case I, I don't think you can say it's been hypocritical. When you say, when you say that going in on, on a humanitarian uh, uh, mission, uh, fighting alongside the rebels is, 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 doesn't qualify then as, as humanitarian work? Well, I think the, the, the point is it's, it's going to be hard to prove either way. And, and people who are going to Syria for humanitarian purposes, and it can't be proved that, that, that anything else is happening otherwise, aren't going to be the ones being targeted by the UK government for its on return. The people being targeted by the UK government are going to be those that have, that have in the balance of probability is all likelihood, are fighting with al-Qaeda-aligned groups. They're the sort of people that this legislation is being aimed at, not people who are genuinely looking to take part in uh, aid work, humanitarian relief. It's the people who are joining up with terrorist groups. Sagir Hussain, what with this argument, protection... The, the difficulty yeah. with this argument... Yes, carry on. Sorry. The difficulty with this argument is that um, all kind of names and allegations and demonizations are, are leveled at individuals. Uh, but then, and, and executive decisions are made to make to strip them of their citizenship, and then there's a difficulty of getting remedy going to the courts, um, and most of the evidence in court, unfortunately, becomes secret evidence. So what you have is an individual who's stripped of their citizenship based on intelligence, which we know in the past very often is quite unreliable. And yet, as a result of losing uh, their, their citizenship, they are uh, subject to potentially being uh, droned or renditioned, and they are very difficult for them to actually challenge that because the evidence that is used against them, even in the, in the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, ends up being in, in, in secret evidence. So once a decision is made, it's very, very difficult to actually challenge it. Claire Agar. Well, there's, there's also a more, I mean, I completely agree with that, I, but I think that there's a more practical point, which is that if, if they've been droned, then, then there is no appeal in any event. But also, even if one has been, you know, an individual has been stripped of his citizenship abroad, in reality, there is no, I mean, there's supposedly an appeal, but if you've been stripped of your nationality and you are abroad, you are not actually going to be able to get back into the UK to bring that appeal, and you're not going to be able to appeal it from abroad because judicial review has been removed from people who aren't resident in the UK. Um, the other point that I was going to make, which I think is interesting, is that you know, this is being done in the name of security, and I am not sure that it assists security of this country or the world to take somebody who is a terror suspect and to leave them, as it were, in a place where, uh, that, where they're far less able to be monitored or, or kept uh, track of than they are in this country. Um, you know, most of these people are being stripped of their citizenship in places like Somalia. Um, and, you know, once somebody is in Somalia, it is extremely difficult to monitor then what they do there. Um, and obviously we're in a world where people can travel, um, probably not the people whose citizenship has been stripped, but quite possibly people to whom they speak. So I am not sure that actually this even furthers the goal of making the world a more secure place. Sakir Hussain, what protection, if any, does international law offer someone in terms of uh, a citizenship? Is it legal to intentionally make someone stateless? Britain's a, a signatory of uh, the 1961 UN Convention on the Reduction of, of Statelessness. D d does that help? Well, I'm, I'm not the relevant expert on the issue of the international law obligations involved here. I think the government's trying to say that we can pass that, but they, it seems that they just want that matter to be tested later on in court, and they'll deal with it that. But what I wanted to focus on was this. Apart from statelessness and the danger to this individual's stripped of their citizenship, my concern is that this power will be expanded and the state has now got this power just like many of the powers that the states all states get they'll use it and, and expand it and the concern here is that the climate within which this law has come into place is actually more of an anti-immigration uh, climate so therefore at the, at, at the moment they've managed to get it through on the cover of or the disguise of security and nobody wants to be seen to be opposing in parliament so they got that through quite easily and the concern is that what will happen next is well a terrorist is not a conducive to public good. Then you start looking at different kind of criminal offences. And in, if, in essence, what it means is that anybody who was uh, uh, from immigrant background or whose parents were immigrants, their citizenship has almost overnight become second class, has become conditional. Because yeah. this kind of power will not be used to somebody who's born and bred, grew up in Newcastle over the last couple of centuries. All right, aside from, from those who've been deemed to have to obtained their, their British citizenship by 
fraudulent means. The, go the government's used its, uh, its powers almost exclusively uh, against Muslims. At least five of those have lost their citizen who've lost their, their citizenship were actually born in the UK. What, what are we to make of that? Well, well, this is this is this is the whole concern because the issue is even people who were born here because their parents were from abroad it applies to them and if people look at it much more carefully what this power is going to enable the home secretary uh, and other people it's going to be is that you know really anybody of immigrant background is now their citizenship is much weaker than it was before let's put that to uh, to robin simcox then is is their citizenship weaker than than it was before will these powers be widened to taking criminal offenses I think this is getting way over the top. No one really believes, no one seriously thinks that the British government is going to start deporting uh, foreign-born people en masse. It's, it's just fanciful. It just won't happen. Um, I did want to come back quickly on this uh, idea of, of enhancing or detracting to our security. From MI5's point of view, from the security service point of view, there's already thousands of people in the UK that they are tracking, who are terrorism suspects, that they believe will, will aspire to carry out a terrorist attack. The way that MI5 put it is that they can only hit the crocodiles nearest the boat, is what they say, because of, uh, because of lack of, of resources. Now, from their point of view, surely it makes sense if there is something you can do, if there is a very clear uh, threat to British lives from someone who's based abroad, but there's the ability to stop him coming back into the UK and possibly carrying out that attack, of course they're going to try and do it. This isn't some kind of, I don't think this is about immigration. It's not about, um, about whether there's too many foreign people in the UK. It's about very specifically uh, the right to protect the UK from foreign terror suspects. This is essentially about saving, people, saving people's lives from being blown up from terrorism. So I think we've got to always keep in mind that this isn't, this isn't happening in a vacuum. This is something because of a, a, serious, a serious issue. It's like here, I know you want to come back in. Hang on just a moment, Claire. No, I mean, I, I was only going to say, um, I think that when one's confronted with, with terrorism, obviously, that's the point at which everybody says anything goes. And I think actually it's the point at which one should say we should hang on to the things that are important um, in terms of the laws that we've created over hundreds of years. And I think this is a very good example of that, that you shouldn't just be looking at citizenship stripping um, if, if that's sort of one thing in the arsenal, especially without any recourse to the law. I also did have quite a fun time because the, the wording of the law is actually pretty broad. It's, it's uh, if people are, I think it's if people are engaging in things that are not conducive to the public good. And, and obviously this Home Secretary, very unlikely, but, but future Home Secretaries, I was of thinking you know possibly people who are anti-europe could 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 be uh, could be citizen stripped and and then there's people who don't agree with trident and i mean the the, the fun that one could have with the with with, with the law is is uh, is endless but, on, Robin, but Robin. i mean i know i know at the moment it's it's Hi. reasonably narrowly okay. confined Let i would just say in world war ii this was available and four people were citizen strip citizenship stripped and in the last four years it's been 16 sorry two years it's been 16 which is quite an interesting comparison when one looks at relative threats. All right, we'll, we'll come back. We'll, we'll come back to Robin in a moment. But first, Sakir Hussain, I know you want to come back on that. Yeah, I just wanted to do, I just wanted to sort of, uh, cover the point Robin mentioned about the security services advice given to the Home Secretary whether somebody is a dangerous terrorist or not. Um, one particular case I was involved in actually where the security services actually advised the Home Secretary says let the persons come back to this country and uh, don't strip them of their citizenship. Yet the Home Secretary Theresa may overrule that advice and simply used it for her political, in my opinion, her, her political uh, expediency. And so in reality, th th these kind of powers are very dangerous uh, for any uh, politician and uh, any politician under pressure uh, from the media or from the tabloids or from a party like UKIP, they got to be seen to be tough. And unfortunately, what we're seeing here, and that's why I mentioned the whole issue of immigration, that the moment, the one sort of a kicking football that everybody's talking about is, is foreigners and, and, and immig immigrants. And I, it seems that this government is using the cover of security to actually appease the anti-immigration lobby. Robin Simcox, you're shaking your head. Well, I mean, it's just not the case. I mean, does anyone really think, anyone who lives in this country really think that the British government is going to use this as a cover to start deporting people who don't agree with Trident or who don't think we should be part of the European Union? It will just never happen in a million years. And as to the other point, I think it's a good thing that the security service and the Home Secretary don't always agree. And the, and the Home Secretary doesn't always agree with, um, 
with judges in this case. There should be, there should be disagreements. It should be part of the natural give and take of British politics. I just think we've got to be really careful to not go over the top on this issue. I mean, there's accusations that people go over the top on, on, on uh, enhancing security, but I think we've also got to have a responsibility here to have a sensible debate. And this isn't going to be used as this isn't the thin end of the wedge. People aren't, the governments aren't going to start using this to deport all and sundry. It's going to be very, very narrow and very measured. Claire Argo, are you going over the top? Possibly slightly with Trident, but um, but I think there's another interesting uh, discussion to be had here. I, I always think it's fun to, to think about what might happen if France did this. So France has someone who they think is, is a dangerous terrorist, and that person lands in London, and they say, actually, we don't want them anymore, and they, they strip the citizenship from that person. Um, and England ends up with this person. Now, obviously, again, that is not going to happen, but it's an interesting thing to think about if you think about it in the context of what we are doing to other countries, the, the international relations point, which goes that we are waiting until somebody leaves our country, and we are then, they travel on a British passport, uh, and despite the fact that of what, what the passport says in terms of us, you know, ensuring their safe passage and so forth, we then tear up that passport and leave that person for that country to deal with, um, which seems you know, uncivilised to say the least, Rob, um, but Simcoe. also extremely... Uh, yeah, so Robin Simcoe, so let's well, get back just, to this, that this that issue of... That country could reasonably of, ask of, us to take the person back. Let's get back to this issue of, 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 of the stateless. What happens if, if someone has renounced their citizenship in their country of origin in order to become a British citizen? Uh, the, the amendment says that there has to be reasonable grounds for an individual uh, to be able to gain citizenship elsewhere before they're stripped of their British citizenship. W what happens if that's not possible? Well, my understanding is that the, the, that the application wouldn't be made and the Home Secretary wouldn't really try and take on those kind of cases. I mean, obviously, this is, a, a, this is developing law and it's a new bit of law, and so the, the, we'll have to see on that. Um, but, but my understanding is that, that it, in those kind of cases that the British government, when it knows it wouldn't be able to succeed, it wouldn't try and bring that kind of case. Claire Aga. Well, you say that, but that's exactly, that's exactly what this piece of legislation is about. I mean, the Home Secretary's been able to do this to dual nationals, du people with dual citizenship for, for quite a while. This piece is precisely dealing with people who would then be left stateless. Sakia so Hussain. Yes, in, 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 in practice, what I've seen is that somebody who has no other citizenship, was actually born here, was um, taken, their citizenship was stripped off them, and they were, it, the court was told that this person can apply for this.